David, the university has identified rapid urbanisation as a grand challenge. What's your role in that? I'm the lead of that, which means I convene and make a noise about it and work with other people to make it a success. And why is it such an important focus for you and I'm such a grand challenge? Yeah. I'm glad you asked. City growth around the world is 1.4 million people a week. A week. It's 200,000 people a day, people being born in cities mostly and people moving. The world is changing. It's the defining shift of our times. And so why are you so uniquely placed to be the leader on this? Oh, I, um, I, I, I've been involved doing this and, and working in this area for quite some time in different parts of the world. It's a phenomenon that's extraordinary, but it involves an awful lot of people coming together and working on it. So how will you get students and staff at UNSW to be involved in addressing it? Yeah, well, it's, um, it speaks for itself. Cities are amazing, they're exciting. They have wonderment, they have greatness, they, they have struggles, they have all these things happening. And a lot of us, well, most of us in the world live in cities. So it's right there and it's around engaging, listening, talking, not much selling needed because it's such, a, such an extraordinary issue. In terms of UNSW's global strategy, how does it fit in with that? It fits perfectly. It's Australia's global university. This is a global phenomenon, social impact, uh, cities where we get the extremities of wealth and poverty, inclusion. It ties to other grand challenges as well, refugees. Most refugees around the world live in cities, not in camps inequalities. So this is one which connects in, in a number of ways across the university. Right, and across the world. Yeah, It's a global thing. Yeah. So th what about this conference you're having, which is about resilience, urban resilience in the Asia Pacific? How did this come about? It came about uh, a conference held five years ago in America with one of the partners, Harvard University. We're doing part two, so it's, it's Harvard, it's UNSW of course, and it's Arab one of the world's biggest engineering firms, and Australian Red Cross, part of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, the world's biggest aid movement. So it's practice and it's research. How do we challenge the issues of climate change and disasters in a meaningful way in the Asia Pacific? Well, region is a big word, but in this, in this part of the world. And, and that's in terms of, for you, it, does it combine other issues such as rapid urbanization? Yes, very much so. It is focusing mostly, mostly on the most vulnerable, uh, but we're thinking about Pacific Islands, which are rap rapidly urbanizing. It's surprising to think that, but Solomon Islands or Fiji or you name it, growing very quickly in cities. And what does that mean and how do we manage them? Because there's a chance to get it right across the world. Uh, it's not too late, if you like. And, and so for you, what would you like to come out of a conference rather so it's just not just all talking? What would you like it to lead to? Yeah, well, we have great people coming. We have the Under Secretary General of the Red Cross Movement. We have some of the world's leading scholars coming. It's, it's accurate to say from the US and the UK on these subjects. So it's practice and it's research. We'll have two, three hundred people all being well. We've already had uh, 60 or more expressions of interest to lead sessions. It, but it's about so what? So outcome is policy and practice and partnerships and working and collaborations. So it could actually lead to some specific programs in certain parts of the Pacific? Very much so. No, uh, we have co colleagues from Fiji who are coming, uh, from Malaysia who are coming, across the region. So it's very much about so what? So can you give me an example of where perhaps there's been a great model of rapid urbanisation in this region? Wow, that's, you know what, uh, I, I've been racking my brains. That doesn't mean they're bad, but it depends how you take it. If you're a poor person living in a low-income settlement, cities aren't great. But if you're in a well-planned city, and of course Australia has Canberra, it has Sydney, it has Melbourne, some of the most beautiful cities, the most popular cities in the world. I think the answer is when, when they grow in a way that's fair for people who are especially vulnerable, then, then you get a good city. Why did you set out in architecture and how did it lead to, to this journey? Well, I was lucky to have been trained as an architect and I, and I really mean that. The early 90s, I did a different course. I'm from the UK. I did a course there on development and the world opened up. The, the vast majority of people who are poorer don't engage so much with any kind of professional. So the issue is how do you engage meaningfully rather than not being relevant? And that's been my personal journey. So where, where did it take you studying architecture? How did it lead into studies of poverty and disease yeah. and, and, and developing countries? Yeah. Well, architecture is a broad church, so it's built environment. And if, and if you see the issues we've just talked about, so for me it was Latin America, then it was bits of Asia, and then it was in fact Europe, then it was Southern Africa, and then more laterally Southeast Asia and Pakistan and Nepal and India, places that are growing so fast and urbanizing so rapidly 
but without professionals. People so you were traveling this. to all those places and, and y- seeing what yes, was going on? Yes, and living on. in Southern Africa, but also right. uh, working mostly with NGOs, doing stuff and latterly in the university world. And so what did you learn when you were living in Africa and working in this area that you then took to Norway and that you bring here to Australia? Well, humility, <laughs> listening. I think those are the key things. People are remarkable. People actually, imagine you're a, you're a mother of seven, you're maybe 21 years old, uh, you work seven days, 12 hour shifts, you live in an informal settlement. What are you, you going to say? I mean, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. So it's about listening, unlearning the answers, engaging. And that's not being lost. This is not the council of despair, but actually understanding and recognizing who has the power, whose reality counts as a phrase a lot of aid people use. And, and, and what are the ways to do something about that in a way that supports and not provides, if you, if, if you like. So can you think of any people perhaps that have inspired you the most along the way? Lots and lots. Yeah. <laughs> those kinds of stories, actually. Yeah. Uh, those kinds of stories, my tutors uh, in the UK, uh, my colleagues here, uh, looking at people, what people do in law and elsewhere, the extraordinary things they do, and they lead from the front about making a difference. So, so and I suppose also it's about not kind of coming in as the rescuer no. to these sort of communities no. and learning from people who are actually living yeah. in it and, and living the consequences yes. of rapid urbanisation. Yes. Where have they sort of most changed your mind and made you reassess what you're doing perhaps? Um, my early experience in the early 90s actually being part of a house building project in, in Mexico City in a slum and it's very obvious that the last thing you want to do is to build someone a house when people are unemployed standing around thinking what's the point of that? It's about jobs and livelihoods and economies and engaging and listening and doing all those things. So on the first bit of what you said, straight after a disaster, there's immediate life saving, but then slow down. All the research, all the evidence is slow down, take time to listen. The Nepal earthquakes, the disasters that are happening, heaven forbid right now, there will be ones happening right now. Slow down and listen to us. We're not helpless victims. We're the people who have survived and pulled our neighbors out of the rubble, literally. And actually we want support, not to be told what to do. And where is the opportunities after disasters in rebuilding? Well, it's engaging. It's, it's people after disasters engaging, supporting, helping to rebuild. And the big thing in the aid world right now is give people money. And that sounds odd and people think, but what if they spend it on the wrong thing? But then you say, well, whose reality is it? Is it what I think you should have? Or what would you rather have? You know, we call it agency, right? The, the ability of people to choose. And good development, good responses on the urban world, also in rural too, you know, it's around agency and supporting people. Mm-hmm. So how do you switch off from this world? Because I imagine it's all consuming. You know, you must walk out the door and you're in a city that's rapidly <laughs> urbanizing. So how do you actually switch off from what you do and relax? Well, it, was, it was a privilege living in Sydney. I mean, this is a beautiful city. My, my first thought was Netflix. <laughs> the second you said that is probably watching TV. Uh, but you know what? I mean, it's, it's, it's a privilege working in this area. It's a total privilege for learning and listening and engaging. And actually it's quite nice not to switch off from it because it's, it's, you never it's want a privilege. To. No, why would you? Why would you? You know, cities are amazing. So what's your ultimate ambition, I suppose, for cities and for yourself? Um, well, well, the first one about cities, of course, is that they're fairer. I think that, that's the, that would be my takeaway from that on a personal level, you know, to engage more, to, to, to understand more. And I think for UNSW, I mean, uh, the, the ambition on the Grand Challenge is to, is to, is, is to be a valuable contributor in Australia in Sydney and also beyond about what what does it really mean to engage meaningfully. Okay, David, ready for the speed round? Okay. All right. What are you listening to at the moment? What's on your playlist? The world's longest running soap called The Archers from the UK. How long's it been going for? About 75 years. <laughs> which I've been listening to it for 36. I would not have thought you were a soapy star. There you go. Excellent. What are you reading? Um, the, the Economist, which is a newspaper from England, mostly about Brexit and how my country is disappearing into meaninglessness. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. What was your favourite subject at school? Maths. You loved maths? Yes. Oh, that's good because you use it. Do I? <laughs> Do you have an early memory? What's the earliest thing you remember? Four years old, the first day of going to school with a pump bag with, with trainers in it. Well, they were this big. Yeah. And look where you've come. And do you have a guilty pleasure you'd like to share with us? Yes, it's watching good TV, but bad TV also. That can be good as well. Well, thank you so much. It's fascinating. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.